the subject matter for the sermon this morning is being prepared for God to use you. We need to make sure that we're all prepared in our own life for God to be able to use you. And we're getting to a lot of points here. And before we even get into Ezra chapter 7, my first point comes from Proverbs. We've been studying through the Proverbs, so I didn't want to start off in that passage. And in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1, I'll just read this for you. The Bible says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. And my first point is we need to have a ready ear. We need to be ready to receive wisdom. We need to incline our ear unto the truth and apply our heart to understanding. We need to first, you know, if you're going to be used by God at all, you need to get a little bit of wisdom. You need to understand what the Bible says, what God is even telling you. This is where we get our instructions from God. And if you want to be used by God, if, you, if you're here this morning, you say, you know what, I love God, I want to serve God, I want to do things for God. The first thing you need to do is get some wisdom, get some instruction on what you're supposed to do. A lot of people have willing hearts and they want to serve God and they, and they, and they end up doing things, but not according to knowledge. They have a zeal not according to knowledge. And that's not pleasing to God. What God prefers, even more than, than your own personal sacrifice of your time and efforts, is obedience. God wants you first to listen to Him before you just go off half-cocked or go off willy-nilly and just start just doing a bunch of things. Now, God wants you to be doing things for Him too, but He wants you to make sure that you're doing it His way. You're doing it the right way. You're doing what He wants you to do. Without having the instruction, without having your ear ready to hear, you don't have any idea. Now, I think most of the people in this room, I, I, I know personally, and, and, and you, know, you have a ready ear. You're ready to listen. But that's step number one. And one of the ways we're going to do that, and, and it, this isn't something that you just do once, by the way. This isn't something that you just, oh yeah, I heard once. And then you don't need it anymore. This is a continual thing. This is something you need over and over and over again throughout our lives. And we need to be able to set apart time daily to read the Bible, to read God's Word, to receive that instruction. Real famous verse, we've got it printed back here, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See, it's talking here about being a workman. If you, if you want to be prepared, if you want God to use you, excuse me, if God's going to use you, you're going to be doing work for Him. You're going to be a workman. And if you want to be a workman that's not ashamed, then you need to be studying God's word. Not just reading God's word, but studying God's word. I mean, when you study something, think about when you study for a test. Do you just read your material and that's it? That's not what I did when I was in school. When I was studying for a test, you go over stuff over and over and over again. You make sure you know it. You, it's, not just a, it's not like reading a novel and you just, oh, okay, yeah, well, that was nice, and you put that down. No, when you study something, you are, you are looking at it very closely. You are trying to really understand what's going on and retain the knowledge that you're receiving. You're going to be comparing Scripture with Scripture. You're going to be looking at different topics and understanding what is it that God wants me to know. That is what it means to study. And when you study, you're not showing yourself approved unto other people in church. It's not so that you can be all proud and lifted up and just, just boast everyone how much Bible you know. You're making yourself approved unto God. And, and think about that. It's not, you're, not, you're not starting to show yourself approved unto me either, the pastor. I'm not, you know, I'm not putting my stamp of approval on you and that's what you need. Oh, pastor said I need to do this, so I'm just going to please him. No, do, um, do the amount of studying that you think God is going to be pleased with. That's who we are doing this for. Anyway, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's why it's important to study because we need to be able to, to not get caught up in false doctrines. The vast majority of the false, almost 99% of the false doctrine out there is going to be from people yanking verses out of context. Just, just taking things that they want to mean a certain way. And when you don't have a foundation in God's word, when you are not studied in his word, it's a lot easier to be deceived. It's a lot easier to be tossed around with every wind of doctrine. We need to make sure we have a foundation that we're planted and that we can rightly divide the word of truth and to stay away from, from heresy and false doctrine. We need to be able to divide and discern what is God's word saying here. 
Because on the surface, sometimes you might find some passages that seem contradictory. Well, if, it's, if you've got the God's Word, God's Word doesn't contradict itself. So we need, that's why the study is necessary. There's many things that are real simple to understand, but there's also some other doctrines that are a little bit deeper, a little bit more difficult. There's mysteries in the Bible. We were just talking about that yesterday at the Hope Fest. You know, even something that we could consider as simple as the Trinity is actually a great mystery. The Bible says great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. We have a discussion with someone trying to say, you know, well, wait a minute. Why does it always say, you know, Jesus, you know, and the Father, and Jesus prayed to the Father and all these other things if they're one? Because I quoted to them, you know, 1 John chapter 5, where it says, uh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I said, well, we believe that because that's what the Bible says. We believe that to be true, that there are, the, you know, the Godhead consists of three parts, and they're one, and, but it's still one of those things that's a little bit more difficult to understand, but see, we need to make sure that we're studying so we can rightly divide and have the faith. Even though some of these concepts might be a little bit more difficult, we need to be able to take what God's Word says at face value and study to, to get a, a proper understanding of, of what it means in the context of the entire Bible. Now, we started off reading here in Ezra chapter 7. One of the things also that we need to do to make sure that we're prepared ourselves for God to be able to use you. You need a ready ear. You need to be in your Bible daily. You need to be reading God's Word, getting that instruction. You also need to be preparing your heart and praying and praying unto God and asking Him for the guidance, asking Him for boldness, asking Him for wisdom, asking Him for the instruction. Look at verse number 6 of Ezra chapter 7. I don't think anyone would argue Ezra was a great man of God. He did great work for the Lord. He was used of God mightily during the time of the rebuilding of the, of the temple. Ezra chapter 7, look at verse number 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon, look at this, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given and the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Now, in the New Testament, the scribes are, are actually kind of looked down upon, the Pharisees and the scribes, but that's because of their religion. It's because they were, for the most part, false prophets. They weren't following the Lord. They claimed to believe in Moses, but they didn't really believe in him. That's not Ezra. Okay, Ezra is not one of those scribes, and this, this comes with rightly dividing the word of truth. When you understand that Ezra did serve the Lord, Ezra was a ready scribe. The scribe's the one, you know, he, he's making the copies of God's words, really involved in a student of God's word. He was someone who was ready. He was a ready scribe. He had his knowledge, he was receiving instruction from the Lord, and he was ready to be used by God in a mighty way. And we see here that Ezra was used. He was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. He understood God's laws. He, he, he had them in his heart. He knew, you know, and God used him. And that's why the king granted him all of his requests. You know, it's, it's not a coincidence here that these, these, um, this was all contained in this one verse. The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. God was using Ezra mightily here. He was a ready scribe. Let's keep reading. And there went up some of the children of Israel and of the priests and the Levites and the singers and the porters and the Nethanims and the Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. And to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Not only was Ezra a ready scribe, he was, he was putting in his time, he was reading his Bible, he was reading God's word, but he had prepared his heart also. He was getting his heart ready to serve the Lord. He was purposing in himself, yes, I want to do this. Now, the... <laughs> One of the biggest parts uh, where, where a lot of people fail, I think, is they have this willingness, but it never turns into action. It never actually turns into doing something. I mean, I can't think of any real believer, anyone who's put their faith in Jesus Christ, who's ever told me, I don't want to do anything for Christ. I can't think of one. I've never met somebody like that. I don't know. I mean, even when I was really backslidden, even when I was living really, really worldly, 
before I ever really was getting right with God after I was saved, if you were to ask me, you know, do you want to do, you know, do you want to do God's will? Do I do according to God's will? Of course I do. Yes, I do. That willingness was there, but there was no action. I was not in my Bible daily. I was not a ready scribe. I was not at all ready to be used of God. It doesn't mean that God couldn't use me. He absolutely could use me. But he needs me to start getting my act together and offering up and preparing my heart to be used of God. To have that willingness, first and foremost, that's, that's not just a surface willingness, but something that's down deep in my heart to actually transform into action, to seek the law of the Lord. I mean, that's, when, when you prepare your heart, you really care to seek out God's Word. I didn't care about seeking out God's Word. I was more concerned about the lust of the flesh. I was walking in the flesh, not in the spirit. But you just ask yourself this question, do you really want to be used of God or not? Do you? I mean, is, think about your life. What is this life all about? Is this life all about just having fun, going on vacations, being entertained? Is that what life is for you? And, and take a step back and just analyze your life and think about, at the end of my life, what do I want to look back on as having done? What is my life meant? What was the meaning and the purpose of my life? Well, we had some really good times. I made a lot of money. It was real comfortable. We went out on boating trips. We went out to these places. We went to that place. It was great. And then you're going to die. And what's going to happen with all that stuff? Nothing. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to say, well, here's all the works that you've done. And if that's the case, it's all just going to be burnt up. And now you have eternity with nothing to show for it. And praise God, you're saved. You're in heaven. I mean, that's, that's what the Bible says, that you're saved, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Amen. Praise the Lord. But the, the short time that we have here, I don't know about you, but I want to use to really do something for God. And it's not just for the rewards, because the rewards are a big part of it. Rewards, the rewards are important to remember that, that, hey, we're going to be spending eternity in heaven, and he's going to be giving you rewards based on what you do here. But you know what else? I love God. Right. He saved my wretched soul. I don't want to just say, hey, thanks, God. Now I'm just going to go off and live a life of pleasure and just do whatever, even if it's not really sinful, but just... Go off and just kind of enjoy my life. No, I love God more than that, and I'm more thankful for what He did for me that now I would rather offer up myself as a living sacrifice unto God and say, God, here I am, use me. You know, you've done so much for me, and it's amazing. Help, just use me to do whatever it is you want me to do, God. I think that's our reasonable service. Amen. I think that's what the Bible says, too. We need to be ready to be used of God. Ezra prepared his heart. He sought out God's word. He loved the law of the Lord. Do you love God's laws? They don't always jive with the way we live. But do you love them? Are you seeking them out? And what I love about Ezra, it says not only did he seek the law of the Lord just to know it, it says, and to do it. Big step there between knowing and doing. And that's like, I'm going to be preaching all about that in tonight's sermon, so um, I'm not going to get too much into that right now. It says, and then not only to do it, but then to teach it. This is, this is a great um, example here of seeking the law, learning it, doing it, and then teaching it to others. And that's kind of a progression that we ought to have in our spiritual life. When you get saved, you ought to be seeking God's Word. You ought to be seeking to the Bible just to learn more. And then as you learn, you need to start doing it. You need to start making it into your life, putting it into practice and saying, okay, I've learned this now. Now I'm going to do it. I've learned that this is a sin. Now I'm going to stop doing that. I've learned that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Now I'm going to start doing it. And as you're doing that, now you can begin to teach others. And be a good influence on them and show them, hey, look, this is what the Bible says. I've already learned this. Hey, look at me. I'm an example. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Come with me and I'll show you how to do it. Come with me. I'll bring you out soul winning. 
This is God's plan for our life. And if you want to be used of God, follow these steps. We've got a lot more to go. Uh, turn, if you would, to... Um, so if you go to Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to read for you from James chapter 1 because part of preparing your heart is, yes, seeking to God's word, yes, doing it and teaching it like Ezra did, but also I mentioned praying. We need to be praying to God, praying for the wisdom and praying for boldness and praying for his help in our life. You know, we've got to, you know, especially right after you get saved, your flesh is strong. You need to overcome that flesh. We need to really um, um, do what we can and we need to be relying on God and start leading a life where we are faithful to God and we are relying on his strength and not our strength alone and trusting in him to go to him with all of our issues and all of our worries and all of our concerns. In James chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. If you don't, if you, if you don't know the Bible very well, if you are, if you are lacking wisdom, ask God. Paul says, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally. What does liberally mean? You know, it's, it's been a little bit perverted in, in today's sense. But liberal just means real freely, right? Think of liberate. When you liberate someone, you're freeing them. When you're, when you're doing something liberally, you're doing it real free. It's just just opening up the doors and just saying, here you go. I'm going to pour out my wisdom on you. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven in with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When we go to God and ask him for things, especially when we ask him for wisdom, you need to believe that he will do that for you. You need to, to have that faith that God is who he says he is. And that he is a God that answers prayers. You see, you can't be, you can't be like, well, I'm going to try this prayer thing and we'll just see if it works. So, God, can you please give me wisdom? And you're like doubting, you know, that's being double-minded. You're going to be unstable in all your ways when you're like that. You just need that faith and say, you know what? I know God's true. God's my Savior. He says it in the book. He made a promise. I'm calling him out on it. He says it right here. I believe it with all my heart. God, give me more wisdom. It's, of course, it's of God's will. He wants us all to have wisdom and instruction and to be smarter and, and to know more about him and what he has for us. He wants that for everybody. But he doesn't just give it to you without you asking him, without you preparing your heart, without you being ready for it. You need to put in effort yourself too. God doesn't just do everything for you. And this is one of the things that I don't like about the, the um, it's like a lordship salvation type of a crowd. Or, you know, people use it, throw around the term sovereign. It's like a Calvinistic type of a teaching that basically God is just in control and is doing everything in your life. That's false. God is expecting things out of us. Now, there are times when God gets involved supernaturally and, 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 and can steer things that happen certain ways and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And there are certain instances where that is the case. I agree. But God is not a God that just, like we're just puppets on his strings and we're just acting out some, some thing that, that we really have no control over. That wouldn't make any sense with the way that the Bible is written and all of the commands and instructions that were given telling us we need to choose. Choose you this day who you may serve. You know, choose for yourself. You, get, you have choice before you. You, know, you have life and death. You have God's law and sin. Choose you your day. What, you're gonna, what are you going to do? It's our choice. We need to be ready. When we go to God and ask him, hey, it's up to you. I can't make you do that. God's not going to make you do that. It's up to you to decide, I want to be used of God. Here am I, Lord. Send me. God, give me wisdom. Stay in Ephesians 4. Though. I'm going to read for you from Psalm 92, verse 13. If you want to be ready and prepared for God to use you, you need to have a ready ear. You need to be reading your Bible. You need to be that ready scribe. You need to prepare your heart. You need to be coming to all the church services. You need to be coming and gathering and congregating together with other like-minded believers. You need to be receiving instruction, not just the most important instruction you receive is from your own personal Bible reading. I believe that wholeheartedly. That's why you need to be doing it every day. I mean, and, and spending a lot of time and studying for yourself. But there is definitely a purpose for church. God has ordained 
pastors and elders and deacons. He has ordained these people to teach. And we're going to get to that in Ephesians 4. I'm going to read for you first from 90, uh, Psalm 92, verse 13. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit in, in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord. I mean, you're here. You're a staple. You're, you're in the house of God all the time. You are cemented in here. If you're like that, you're going to be producing fruit all the way into old age. And, and I'll tell you what, nothing should, you know, we should never let excuses stop us from giving the gospel to anybody ever. Praise the Lord for, for our visitor here today, who is, a, 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 excuse me, sir, a little bit older gentleman than, than, than the rest of us here. But praise God for his service, and he still is going out and talking to people. A lot of people want to just say, well, I'm in retirement age, right? And just think that that's just an excuse now to just stop doing everything. I, I don't believe in retirement. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not planning on retiring at all. I plan on working until the day that I die. And unless I lose my voice, unless I lose something completely incapacitating me, you know, I am going to do whatever circumstance I'm in, my best to still try to get the gospel out to anybody I, I can. Praise the Lord. And that's what we all ought to have, that type of an attitude. And um, one of the ways you're going to do that is by making sure you're planted in the house of the Lord. That's going to help you to accomplish that with your life. Look forward. What do you want your life to be about? Get yourself planted. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11, the Bible reads, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The Bible's explaining here, and I, I have this, I believe I have this highlighted in my Bible, Ephesians 4, because when we go out sowing, we go out talking to people and, and leading people to Christ, I want them to understand the importance of coming to church. Because it is important. Now, when we go out sowing, you know, I tell people, hey, going to church doesn't save you. That's absolutely true. I want them to understand that, that first we need to get this established. You need to get saved. You need to put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Attending some church doesn't save you. I don't care if you've been going to church for 50 years. That's not going to save you. The blood of Jesus Christ is going to save you. You put faith on his name, of course. So we explain that to them, just like we explain it's not of your works. There's no, good amount, you know, no amount of good you can do that can save your soul. It's faith only. It's not based on your works at all. It doesn't matter how good you are, right? Because that's salvation. But once a person puts their faith in Christ, now you need to start explaining to them, hey, you're a child of God, praise the Lord. It's not based on your works, it's based on your faith. But now you do need to start doing the work. Now you need to get in church. And it's not because you might lose your salvation. It's because you need to grow. You're just a newborn babe in Christ right now. You need to grow. You need to do things for the Lord. And God has established the church. He's given gifts on the people. He has ordained people to be prophets and evangelists and teachers and preachers. And he's given you these people. Why? In verse 12 it says, For the perfecting of the saints. The saints, those are sanctified through Jesus Christ, our believers. It's for our perfection. It's to help us to be complete in Christ. It says, for the work of the ministry. You want to be used of God? How about the work of the ministry? Follow some of these leaders that God has ordained to help you. To send people out. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word, by the, by the word of God. How then shall they hear, how they shall, shall they believe in them who they have not heard? And shall they, how shall they hear except they be sent? And 
we, you know, the church is here to be sending people out to do that work of the ministry. And God has ordained for pastors or bishops, whatever word you want to use, an elder to do and perform that job. Being in church is something that God wants for all of us to do. And it's for your edification. It says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. When you come here, it strengthens you. It's going to help you being around other believers. Hearing, hey, I, I talked you know, talk to this person the other day. You know, I want this person, Lord, whatever. You know, we do this, this, this fellowship and we, and we congregate together. And you can be around other people who have the same beliefs as you, that believe in the same God, that believe the same Bible, and that aren't caught away with all the worldly lusts. That strengthens you. You know, most of the time throughout the day, you go to your work, you go to the store, you're surrounded by the world, you're surrounded by a, a, a wicked world, a world of sin. Amen. We need strength. We need to be strengthened so that we're not tempted, so we're not falling away, and, and, and we get that in church. And you know what? When you're going to church once a week, great, praise the Lord, God bless you. But that strengthening, the teaching, the perfecting, why don't you come more? Why don't you come to all the services? Why don't you come, you know, whenever here? And and I'll tell you what, you know, as, speaking as a pastor of this church, I think about all of you, and I care about all of you, and I preach sermons specifically sometimes to help individuals in this church because I care about you. I want to help you to grow more. So I have various people in mind sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I'm thinking specifically about people. And I decide I'm going to preach this sermon tomorrow, you know, and, and the worst thing is when the person I have in mind, the person who I think could really benefit and help from this, isn't here. They missed it. You miss out. When you're not in church, you're missing out on something that might be the, the best sermon you could ever hear in your life. And I'm not trying to lift myself up as if I'm some great preacher. It's not about me. It's just, it's, it's about you and what you need to receive. And there's things that, that are explained and, and, and will be taught from the pulpit that you don't want to miss. You never know what's, what's going to be taught on any given day. And again, I mean, there's many reasons. We went over the, the edification, the fellowship, the strengthening, and the learning. It's all important. It's all important. And it brings us into unity. When we're here together, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're a church. We're a body here. And we need to be in, in unity of faith and of knowledge. We all, we all should be on the same page. Uh, that's the way we're going to work the best together to get the most work done for, for God. And the more often you're here, like in verse 14 says, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. There's a lot of false doctrine out there by people who are real cunning and crafty that are trying to, to, to get you to believe in some heresies. The more you're here, the more you're going to hear taught, and the more we're going to be um, coming together in our faith. Now, another way to be prepared for God to use you. And this is all under my first main point of just being prepared to receive instruction. Okay? We need to have a ready ear. We need to be in our Bible. We need to be, you know, getting our hearts ready. We need to be coming to church. I also recommend when you come to the, especially when you come to the Bible study, reading the Bible, reading the scripture before the service even starts. Come to the, to the Wednesday night Bible study reading what we're doing. What we're, you know, we're going through the book of Proverbs every week, whatever chapter we're on. Why don't you read that on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or all three days? You'll get a lot more out of the sermon when you're already prepared. You've prepared yourself to hear, hey, what's going to be taught? You could start thinking, how is this going to work? And, and you will gain a lot more from what is taught coming in with that ready mind and that ready heart of saying, oh, I've already read some of this stuff. It's going, you know, you'll get more. Just trust me on that. Try it out for yourself. You don't have to trust me on that. Try it, try it out for yourself. Challenge you. Also, take notes. Look up scriptures after service. We, you know, we go through, I, I typically go through a lot of scripture in, our, in, in, in the preaching. Why? Because I'm trying to prove it to you. I want, I want, you know, it's not my words that matter as much as God's words, but we're trying to tie it all together and learn what he has for us to learn here. And, and when I'm making a point, I want to be able to prove it to you. But what you need to do is your due diligence to make sure what I'm saying is right. 
I'm not trying to mislead you, but I'm still imperfect. I don't claim to know everything from the Bible, and you need to make sure and get in the habit of it that you're not just blindly trusting anybody but God. So take the notes. Look up the references. See, if, especially if something's like, I don't know if that's right. Hey, mark that down. When something's like, I'm not sure if that's right, mark that down. Read the whole thing in context. Read the whole book. You know, read, to get, get the understanding to see and to check whether or not what Pastor Burson is saying is true. And, and you don't have to turn there, but in Acts 17, the Bible says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Those were the Bereans. These were the people that, that in the book of Acts, they were, they were hearing God's word taught. Paul, the apostle Paul came in to teach them. And they checked him on it. They said, you know what? They searched the scriptures daily. Every time he's preaching, they're saying, well, we've got to check this. Is what he's saying right? Is it true? But then it says in verse 12, therefore many of them believed because what he was saying was true. They did their diligence. They checked it out. That's what the scripture says. He's right. Amen. They believed him. And that's what we all do. I mean, when you hear the truth preached, Check it out. If it matches, great. Hold on to that. Receive that. The Bible says, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Hold on to that. Keep that. After it's been proven. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. This has all been in, in the main area of being prepared to receive instruction. Just to receive God's instructions for you. Get your heart ready. Get your ear ready. Read His Word. Come to church. Be, be diligent about your attendance in church. Don't just be like, I checked it off and I'm here. Be listening. Be paying attention. Be, be preparing yourself as much as possible beforehand and taking notes, looking things up. But now you need to be prepared to work. See, first you need to be prepared just to receive the instruction. What is it that God wants me to do? These are all the things I mentioned, all things just to, get, just to get the understanding what is it I'm supposed to do. But once you have that done, that's not the end of it because now you need to be ready to work. Now you need to be ready to put it into action. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 20. The Bible says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these... He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. To be prepared unto every good work, we need to be getting the sin out of our life. We need to be meet for the master's use. We need to get ourselves ready to be used. We need to be making sure that we're walking in the Spirit and not in our flesh. When you're just walking in your flesh, God's not going to be using you at all. You'll be walking in the flesh. We need to get rid of these sins out of our life to make ourselves a better worker for the Lord and ready for Him to be used. We need to be able to recognize when we have an open door, when God's opened up a door for us, and to seize on that. Take hold of that and use that. In 1 Corinthians 16, I'll just read this for you, verse 7. The Bible reads, For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost for a great door and effectual is opened unto me and there are many adversaries. The Apostle Paul realized God opened up a door for him to preach the gospel. God opened up this door. He says, hey, I got this great work for you. This door is wide open. He didn't turn and go the other way. He's saying, great, but there's many adversaries. So he's getting ready to, to make sure that he's going to seize on that open door, the opportunity that he has. Now, the Apostle Paul was an apostle. He was, he was a very special man and did a lot of great things. And, and I'm not going to say, you know, our lives don't necessarily mimic the Apostle Paul's life and all of his travels and everything he was doing. But he recognized an open door and sees him. I think one of, the, one of the easiest ways for us to recognize an open door, and this just happened to me yesterday, by the way, is when you are minded about the things of God. When you already have in your heart and you are consciously thinking about it and wanting to serve God, and it's not just because someone asks you, but, but you actually have that in your heart and you want to do something, there's going to be times when you're going to see people and be like, I need to give that person the gospel. 
And I don't think that's just from your own mind. I think the Holy Spirit is prompting us, and there's people that God's saying, go talk to this person. Go give that person right there the gospel. That's an open door. That's something where God's saying, hey, go do this. We don't want to quench that. We don't want to just say, no, I've got other things going on. And like I said, this happened to me yesterday. When, we're, when, I, when I broke down, we, we got, the whole event was done. We got everything you know, boxed up. I got my whole car loaded up. My wife had just left. She's okay, honey. I'll see you. you know, I'll see you at home in a, you know in, in 20 minutes. However long it takes to get home. And I was just about to go. I was walking back from from her leaving, and there's this guy just sitting on a at a picnic table. I could tell he looked like a homeless guy, right? So I walked by, and I looked at him. We made eye contact, and I'm thinking like, man, I should give that guy the gospel. But then these other thoughts start coming in. Well, I got to get home. I got other things to do. I got to write my sermons. I got, you know, it's like I got all this stuff to do. And I look back. I got to give that guy the gospel. I go in my car, pull out a Bible, pull out a bottle of water, go back over there. Now, look, the guy didn't get saved. But we need to make sure that was a perfect door of opportunity. Because I had a chance to sit down for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, however long it was, and go through the entire plan of salvation. Very open. You know, a lot of times homeless people are, are kind of whacked out and crazy and on drugs and everything else, and they're real difficult. Like, you can't even get in and talk sense to them at all. And that was another thought that went through my head. I was like, oh, that guy's probably crazy. You know, all these excuses start popping up before you actually go and do what the Holy Spirit's leading you to do. And all these reasons why you shouldn't go do it, right? That's the flesh. Don't listen to that. This guy was clear. He was coherent. Now he was screwed up on a lot of New Age philosophies and meditation and all kinds of things. But at least he got to hear a very thorough presentation of what he needs to do to be saved. Praise the Lord. And praise God for that. Amen. And we need to make sure that we're not quenching that spirit. The Bible says in, in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the spirit. It is something we can do. You know, the spirit is something that God gives us for our leading and guiding, but it's not something that he forces you to do. We are willing servants of the Lord. We have the option to do what's right or to do what's wrong. He'll lead us if we let him. We'll, he'll, he'll, he'll show us the way. He'll, he'll guide our steps. He'll lighten up the path for us. Now, praise God, I did what was right in that instance, but I'll tell you right now, I'll confess to you, I haven't always done what's right. Many times, even probably this year, relatively recently, there's times where I've ignored that. And shame on me for that. Shame on me for that. And the only reason I'm letting you know that is because I'm not standing up or trying to say I'm perfect. I understand. But we need to be diligent in doing our best and not quenching that spirit and do what we need to do and realize, have the proper understanding that, look, what is it that I really had to do that was so important that would have outweighed this person getting saved potentially? I mean, really. I know we're busy. I know we've got a lot of stuff to do. But... Way more often than not, the things that we have planned to do really aren't that important that you can't take 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, to, to give somebody the opportunity to put their faith in Christ. And you know, that man didn't get saved, but while I was giving him the gospel, some other lady and her children came and sat down at the same picnic table and heard over half of the presentation. And the most important verse is, I would say, I mean, the whole thing's important, but I mean, who knows? There's seeds planted. Right. Amen. So, you know, praise God for that. We need, we, need to, we need to be ready, but we need to be ready to work. We need to have it in our minds. We need to be thinking about it because if you're not even thinking about it, you're going to be looking at people, giving them the gospel isn't even going to come up to you. We need to train ourselves and it's, and it's a, I mean, it's a daily thing. It's not something that happens overnight at all, by any means. So don't, don't you know, you're not going to hear this sermon and just be super Christian overnight. This, is, this takes time and developing and, and growing. But, but it's, the, it's the goal. It's the place that we're trying to be so that we're a soul winner all the time. We offer up soul winning times. Praise God. I love it. We go out and specifically, we have a time set. This is when we go out and preach the gospel. Let's go do it. And that's great. We're going to continue to have that. We should have that. But the goal is not just to be, well, I'm only going to go soul winning during these soul winning times. The goal is that's a training ground so that 
everywhere we go is an opportunity to give somebody the gospel. Yes, let's set some time apart to specifically go and do that, and we'll dedicate an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever the case may be, you know, and we'll go and do it with that specifically in mind. But let's get that in our thoughts daily. I mean, you're at the gas station, you're at a restaurant, you be thinking about people, looking at them and say, here's a, here's a lost soul. Your heart needs to be prepared for that. You need to see that in the instruction of God. I think that's pretty, I, mean, I preach on that quite a bit. So, you, you know, everyone here probably should have seen that many times in the Bible. It's our duty, it's our job. But recognize those open doors and take hold of them. Seize them. Now, being used of God, obviously, a soul is a huge one, but that's not the only way to be used of God. There's many ways to be used of God. That's the most important one, but, but there's lots of things that we can do in service to the Lord and in service to other people, which is, is ultimately serving God. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We need to be able to identify our gifts. God has given us gifts. You know, we read in Ephesians 4, gifts that God has given to men. You know, to some, he's given apostles, evangelists, preachers, teachers, you know, all these different things that he's, that he's given, the Spirit has given unto, unto men to use. But that's not all of them. There's more than even just that. God has given every single individual gifts. He's given us abilities. He's given us talents. He's given us things that, that we are better at than other people are. We need to identify, one, what those things are, and two, put them to use. Just like with the Bible, it's one thing to know what God wants you to do. It's another thing to do it. With our gifts, we need to know what it is that we excel at, that we're apt for, that we're good at, and then start using them and using them for the Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 4. The Bible reads, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So God's given these spiritual gifts for, uh, to, to profit so that we can do work and produce something for God. That's what the profit is, right? To profit with all, verse 8, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, some of the things we saw mentioned in here when it says the tongues, those are languages. There are some things, there are some people that are much better and apt at learning foreign languages. For some people, it comes really easily to them. They, they understand grammar. They understand the, the, you know, the, the, the concepts. And, and people, some people are really good at picking up on, on other languages. And, and praise God for that. I think that's a gift that God has given to people to be able to just kind of pick up other languages and use that. Hey, if that's your gift... Use that for God. Use that. Learn, try to learn the most common languages that you're going to come in contact with. Up here, the second language is going to be Spanish. There are a lot of people that come up from Mexico that only speak Spanish. One way to be used of God is to be able to learn these languages so that now you can reach someone that otherwise you wouldn't have reached and that most people aren't going to be able to reach because they don't speak that language. Use that language. But here's another point I want to make, though, is that how are you ever going to know what your gift is if you're not trying? If you've never even tried to learn a language before, how do you know if you have that gift? How do you know if you have that ability? This is where some of the work comes in. We need to be able to identify these gifts. And oftentimes, you won't even be able to know if you have that gift until you try to do it and try to learn and try to get going in a direction. Preaching. The Bible says that's a gift, being able to, to, to stand up before people and, and preach and be used of God. Hey, that's another gift. Try it out. We, we offer the, the preaching class I do once a month to help train and to, and to guide and to teach and to show you some of the skills and, and some of the things that will be helpful for you to be able to stand up and prepare a sermon and to preach to people and to teach and to do all these different things. I'll try, I'm trying to help you with that. Soul winning. This is something that, that this isn't a special gift. Okay. 
everybody has the responsibility of soul winning. Now, some people may be uh, not as intimidated by it because they're, they're more of a people person. They're not, as, they're not as shy or whatever. But this is a duty that is given to all of us. And this isn't something that, that is just some special. Well, he just has this special. I think everybody, every believer is supposed to be out soul winning. Uh, the Bible mentioned here healing. Now, it's separated, and this is important to understand too, the gifts of healing and working of miracles. And I think that those are separate things. I think some people are really good at understanding being able to heal people with the, with the, you know, with the supplies that God has given to us and having understanding of how our bodies work and, and the way that God made us. I think that, there are gift, that God has given people the gifts of healing and having that understanding to be able to heal people um, and being very good at it and being caring and nurturing to, to bring people back to full health. Obviously, we saw people miraculously healed in the Bible through the power of God. No denying that whatsoever. But, um, you know, that's why the Bible also says here the working of miracles. Because that is, I mean, when, when, the, when, the, when the healing was being done on people in the, in the, around the, the time of the apostles going around and doing those works, that was miraculous healing. No doubt about it. That was totally through the power of God. But God's power is not diminished today. I do believe that there were certain miracles that were being performed at the time. And again, that's a whole other sermon in and of itself to, to establish God's Word, to establish the New Testament, to, to, to get it out there and, and, you know, through the power of God. But I don't think that those, you know, it's just that those things can never happen again either. I don't, I don't believe that. God's power, God's just as powerful as He was throughout history from everlasting. Another gift that's not mentioned in this list, but I believe is a gift that God has given to people is, is being able to play music, musical talents, musical abilities. And, um, you know, right now we don't have, a, we don't have a, a piano player or any instrument player, but, um, you know, I believe God's going to bring us somebody. And maybe you have a talent that you're, you're not aware of if you've never tried doing these things before. You know, I would, I would encourage you to try doing this. And these are all different things that, that you, we could be trying to do. If you want to be used of God, start trying to develop these skills in addition to everything else, in addition to your Bible reading. You know, that's why the first and foremost thing is getting the instruction of God. But hey, figure out what skills you have. If you want to be used of God, there's many ways to be used of God. We could be doing special outreaches to Spanish people. We could be doing, you know, you know playing instruments and, and, and helping just the edification of the church through the, through the song and, and, the, and, the, and the praise that, you know, that we were singing unto God. Doing the song, leading, leading the congregation in the sing. There's all various things and roles that we can do in church and outside of church to, to help others and to be into being a minister unto God. If you want to be prepared for God to use you, you need to show yourself faithful. You need to be a dependable person. You need to be someone that God can rely on to do a work, to get something done. I mean, think about um, even just at a, at a secular job, at a worldly job, at just some, some job out there. If you have an employee that you tell them to do something, May, and you got a 50-50 chance, maybe it'll get done, maybe it won't. The likelihood is very, very high that the boss is going to fire that person and not use them for any work for him to do because he can't rely on him. We need to make sure that when we receive our instruction from God, that he can rely on us, that we could be faithful in doing and performing those things that we're told to do. I mean, even the most basic of things, we need, if we you know, start there, start you know, doing and, and, and showing yourself and proving yourself to be a faithful person. The more faithful you are, the more dependable you are, the more you will be used. I mean, if your goal is, and you know, I'm speaking to people, hopefully, that your goal is to do as much as possible for the Lord. Say, I want to serve God. I want to do that. I have that desire. Show yourself faithful. Show yourself faithful in that which is least. And he'll, he'll just keep adding unto that. He'll give you more. But if you're not listening to the small things, he's not going to give you the big things. I mean, that's why virtually everywhere in any job you start out at, you're going to be starting at the bottom. And you've got to work your way up, right? You've got to prove who you are. You've got to prove your work, prove yourself 
Do the work and show yourself to be dependable. And then you can work your way up. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, turn if you would to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. It's the last, the last scripture we're going to have you turn to, 1 Peter 3. 2 Timothy 2 verse 1 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. He's telling Timothy, that was what Paul is, excuse me, he's telling Timothy, you know, you need to be strong, but he says, the things that you've heard of me, the things that I've taught you, because Timothy was faithful. He was a faithful man of God. Apostle Paul is teaching him. He says, okay, all the things that you've, you've, you've heard of me, and think about the great wisdom and the teachings and the example that the Apostle Paul was. Unto Timothy, now he's saying, well, now, O Timothy, you need to find faithful men to commit the same things unto them. Imagine if you were alive around that time. You, didn't, you, you just heard of the Apostle Paul, but you were right there with Timothy. You were in Timothy's church, right? If you want to be used of God, if you weren't faithful, he's not going to be committing all these things to you that he was learning of the Apostle Paul. You're not going to get all that stuff because he said to commit it unto faithful men. We need to be giving to people who, are, who have shown themselves. Now look, the preaching's still there, but th this is a commitment to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Right? I mean, this is, these are people that he's going to be personally training to, to, to work in the ministry and do work for God. And if you want to be someone that's going to be working for the Lord, you need to show yourself faithful. You need to be showing up to church. You need to be do, getting in your Bible. You need to be doing the work and showing that you can be dependable. And the more you do that, the more is going to be given to you. The more doors are going to be opened up, the more work you're going to get done, the more you're going to get accomplished. I had you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 15. We need to be prepared to give an answer. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You've got faith in God. You want to serve God. Be ready to give an answer to people. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is by the first step, having God's Word, reading it, studying it, knowing it. Memorize the Scripture. You know, we do the... I know we offer the prizes and stuff, but we do the, the Scripture memory. Keep God's Word in your heart. It's a lot easier to give an answer to someone when you've got a Bible verse you could quote to them. If you're prepared to give an answer, one, you'll have some Scripture memorized. Now, I don't expect you to have the entire Bible memorized. That would be a very difficult task. I don't know if anyone's ever done that from the Old Testament and the New Testament whole. Maybe it's been done. I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying not to try. Go for it. Praise the Lord. I think that would be great. But in the meantime, since I don't think anybody here has the entire Bible memorized, if you're going to be prepared to give an answer, make sure you have a Bible with you at all times. Make sure you know that Bible well enough to be able to give the answer so that you can turn to a scripture, even though you don't have it memorized, you can say, well, I know it's, it's right over here. Know where, know where the references are at least. Even know where it is close enough to be able to say, I know it's in chapter 2 or 3. Let me look real quick. You know, find it. Be prepared. Be ready to give that answer. And again, this doesn't happen overnight. And, and, and what you, you can't let happen is get discouraged because someone asked you a question and you didn't have an answer. You know what? You should have had an answer. But use that then to say, you know, I'm going to go home and I'm going to get this answer. I'm going to make sure I'm going to be diligent that next time I'll have that answer. Which we all have to grow. I mean, that's, that's the course that I went when I was you know, going out knocking on doors. Now, it's been a long time, I think, since anybody stumped me on, on just a question. And look, I get stumped. Okay, I'm not saying I don't get stumped sometimes on things I've never heard before or, so, you know, not quite sure how to, how to answer somebody. But it's been quite a while because most of the, you know, when you go out soul winning, most of the people have the same issues. It's, it's mostly the same problem. So, but for a long time, especially early on, you start dealing with Pentecostals and Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, all these different, they have all these crazy beliefs and they come at you with something and I'm just like, you know, what are you even talking about? Obviously I know it's false but I didn't know where to go to disprove them. Every time I do that, I write it down 
after talking to them, go home, look it up, and then mark it in the Bible for the next time. We ought to have that type of... If you're diligent, if you're serious about working for God, if you're serious about it, you ought to be doing something similar. Getting yourself ready, being prepared, and, uh, and doing your own studies, being ready to teach other people is a, is a great goal. That's what Ezra had as a scribe. He sought out the Lord, he sought out the law, he did it, and taught others. Get yourself to the point in your spiritual life. Even if you're never going to be officially a teacher in some, you know, may, maybe, you're, maybe you're a woman, you're never going to be a pastor of a church. Get yourself ready to be a teacher because you know what? You're going to be able to teach your children. You're going to be able to teach the other ladies in the church all the things that, that the Bible says that, that the elder women should be teaching the younger women. You'll be able to teach, you know, you, you, can, you could have communication with people individually. You could teach people at the doors. You could disciple people. You could help people in that respect. You don't have to have this one position of being the bishop. And say, well, now I'm not going to do any of the work because I'm, I don't, what do I have to worry about? I'm not going to be the pastor. There's so, so, so much more to do. There's a lot of need out there. There's a lot of ministry that needs to be done. There's a lot of people that, that we need to do things for and work for the Lord. God wants people who are ready. God wants people who are prepared. Let's prepare ourselves in this church daily. Let's prepare ourselves and continue to prepare ourselves so that God can use us mightily. We can bring the most honor and glory unto His name and, and, and do the work that He has set out for us by one, learning, and two, doing, putting it into action. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for Your instruction, Lord. Help us to have ears that are open and ready to receive. Dear Lord, I know we have a church full of willing people. Lord, help us to translate our willingness into action. Help us to, to have the proper instruction and understanding, dear God. Teach us from your word daily as we read from your word, dear God. Help us to, to, to retain that knowledge, to, to sink in, and to, and to put it into action, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.